My name is Stephanie Marquez. I am a senior supply chain consultant here at RPI. Uh, my area of expertise of all things contracts. So, Hi, my name is Sasha Delphius. I'm a supply chain consultant here at RPI as well. Stephanie and I worked together for the extent of me being here, so about three years. <laughs> yeah. uh, we do a lot of things, contract management and strategic sourcing, so uh, check out some of our old webinars. <laughs> Absolutely. So what are we gonna talk about today? Our focus today, we're gonna touch upon capturing document signatures specific to uh, contract management and its integration with electronic signature tooling, DocuSign. We're gonna walk through some recommendations for planning this, for uh, preparing setup steps, prerequisites, things of that nature, and also discuss what it takes to implement. Then at the end, we're going to talk through what you could expect the system to look like or an example, whether you be, uh, you're in testing or if you're in a go-live environment. Okay, so by the end of this webinar, we hope you are equipped with the information needed to plan, prepare, and implement the IDM and document sign signed signature integration for your organization. Isn't that kind of funny? I said that little weird. tongue tied. Yeah. Implement the IDM <laughs> and DocuSign integration for your organization. There you go. <laughs> All right, so let's talk planning. Uh, first thing that's so important and that we often find is overlooked with a lot of individuals is having a comprehensive knowledge of your current process. Um, from there, what will the process to capture those documents and those signatures look like? What does that look like in current state? Where within your contract process do you find that? Um, will the integration of the functionality change or modify your existing process? So anytime we make a modification, there's always going to be some level of impact. Mm -hmm. So this will help you kind of identify where that is. Um, you're going to want to determine what document types you actually want to use this with. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but you do have some flexibility there. Um, and what approval type will you use with this process, mm -hmm. if any? Yeah, so it's a critical part of this planning stage um, to understand your current state workflow. Yeah. I think we talk about that like all the time, current state, future state, current state, future state. Um, so what steps are going to happen inside and outside of the system? Um, that's vital in when you're drafting out and outlining and discussing your workflow and understanding the roles and responsibilities for each stage within that workflow. So this will help in identifying any gaps, which will be helpful in planning and outlining a future state business process. And some questions to consider for future state. So one, can you anticipate process change? Mm -hmm. And most likely that's gonna be yes. Sometimes it could be minimal, uh, but some, there are times we've seen uh, with our clients that these that certain steps happening outside the system, they're, no, they're now obsolete or they are simplified and condensed um, as the system supports it you know, within the application. Right. Um, and then another question cons to consider is, uh, who will participate in training and testing the new process? So when you have a solid crew of resources who will support in testing, training, and calling out pain points, as well as issue resolution, you're, you're now creating your super user team, mm -hmm. right? And it will be essential to any implementation. Yep, absolutely. So we wanted to bring to you an example of what a future state process flow could look like. So this is an actual flow that we've worked with one of our clients on. And this client decided to include the document signature process in their end-to-end -end contract process. So please keep in mind, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's gonna depend on a couple of different things. So I know that working between healthcare and public sector, you could find that this process may look different based upon the industry of your organization is a part of. And two, does your organization have any specific compliance needs that might mm -hmm. be driving what that process looks like? So again, it could look very different. In this example here, the client is using contract approvals and their identifier that the contract is then ready for signature is actually after it receives the internal contract approval and contract review. Um, so that happens within their procurement team and their department leadership and stakeholders are a part of that process as well. So what's happening is after they uh, receive that approval, we know that the contract status updates to a ready to activate. And that's procurement's visual cue to say, okay, mm -hmm. now I'm ready for my signatures. Now mm -hmm. I'm ready for that electronic, com or electronic signature component to take place. Um, and so from there, they integrate in that signature process. Once all the documents are signed, 
their contract managers and responsible for activating the contract. So it's really kind of a very specific section within that process. And I think it's, it's worth making mention that with the DocuSign process, there isn't currently a system notification that lets you know. There are some other visual cues that we'll look at a little bit later, but it really is gonna take you kind of defining what this process looks like. So you're, you know, part of the, the preparing and planning mm -hmm. is knowing who's doing what. And, and looking for those cues. So um, it, it's going to be, you know, something that you'll want to work through. So question for you. Mm -hmm. Does the state of the contract matter when I, like, does that, the state of it de determine um, when I can start my DocuSign process? That's a good question. So with this specific client, we actually tested it in a couple of different uh, contract statuses. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were able to find that you can do the DocuSign process, that integration piece, while the contract is in draft. So it doesn't even have to be released within the Cloud Suite application in order to use that integration. So again, this is why we're so, you know, we talk so much about business process and mm -hmm. figuring it out because it will look different depending right. upon what status you take that action in. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. All right, so another thing to keep in mind is the document signature process. It's available for all document types and it's enabled at the document type level. So this is not a global setup where it's now enabled for all of them. Mm. You define, you pick and choose which document types you want to enable the document signature process for. Mm -hmm. So when you enable this flag, it makes it accessible within the application. And so you want to check out the document management control center. So that's what the, the screenshots are showing. And this will be where you can review the document type options and consider which document types will be enabled for the document signature process. Yeah, that's so that's still just kind of uh, following along with that current state process flow mm -hmm. and outlining the future state and understanding uh, which document types will be applicable, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's also kind of worth noting that this whole process, there's really a lot of flexibility that you mm -hmm. have. As you're saying, you can kind of go through, familiarize yourself with what contract document types or document types are available for right. this process. And then, like you said, pick and choose. Right. Okay, so now that we've talked through some of the planning steps, let's talk about some of the prerequisites and testing to prepare and implement IDM and DocuSign for your organization. Okay, so when we think about preparing for this implementation, the first thing that comes to mind for us is actually making sure you have the DocuSign license. Mm -hmm. So I know it seems kind of funny, but this is not something that is supported through the N4 licensing. Right. So you want to make sure that you're obtaining your own and when you obtain this license, or if you already have it, reviewing what the license actually supports. Mm -hmm. Because if, uh, you, if you're a part of a larger organization and it's only supporting, what, five to 10 contract documents, that's not gonna be enough, right? right. So you wanna make sure that it holds the capacity of the document you anticipate to send through the document signature process. I think that that's really vital though, because a client that I'm currently working with, they did that. They did a review of what their DocuSign licensing looked like, and it was exactly that. It was like a, a much smaller capability. It was limited to, I believe, one user. So there were mm -hmm. some constraints that they found. And then as a result of wanting to implement this into their Go Live, they, you know, up their licensing, decided to go with a more appropriate license that mm -hmm. would accommodate their organization. So okay. that's a really good point to good. articulate. Yeah, so the next thing here, uh, you wanna create an Infor support ticket. And you wanna request to enable the tenant feature flag for your testing environment and eventually your live environment. So when this is rolled out, what this will do is enable the flag that allow access to the IDM signature user security role. Mm -hmm. So when you assign that security role to a, a resource, mm -hmm. then you're allowing the, the option to initiate and execute mm -hmm. the do document signature process. Yep. So keep in mind that this security role is only visible when that tenant flag is defined, which is why it's critical or important or required or however you want to think about it to, to open that Infor support ticket, whether it's just a verification right. or just, you know, hey, this is new setup, new to me, can you set it up? Right, right, exactly, and that's a good point though because that tenant feature flag is not something that we have access to, right. it's not something that our clients have access to, so when in doubt, enter in that Enforce support ticket. The worst thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna say, oh, it's already enabled, you're good to go, right. and then you can follow along with the rest of the prerequisites. Right. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, so then the next thing we want to talk about is now enabling the use IDM flag at the contract classification level. Mm -hmm. So we don't talk too much about contract classifications here, but for clients utilizing contract management, contract classifications are required for any contract you create in the system. It's going to drive contract approvals if you choose to enable them. It's useful for security, and it's also useful report for reporting. Yep, and as you mentioned before, Sasha and I have done so many of these uh, webinars and different talks together. We have actually done some that are specific to classification yes. and provide some details. So I would encourage you to kind of check those out if you are having any questions about contract classifications. And then so finally, we're going to jump over to the DocuSign license you've obtained, right? So you've, you've figured out the right one you need. Mm -hmm. And now what we need from that account is grabbing those credentials mm -hmm. so we can add them over to FSM. So when we add them over to FSM, this is how we're allowing both IDM and DocuSign to talk to each other. Yep. And, and this is pretty much like one of the final pieces of of setting everything up so that you can start your testing process. Yeah, I will say when I was uh, getting this established within our sandbox, this area is the one that I struggled with the most. So if you are doing this and you're finding that you're having some connectivity issues, I would say start here um, with this uh, credentials, as you mentioned, that are loaded. I think I had copied and pasted and missed a value at the end. Mm -hmm. So you know, any little thing like that's gonna throw it off and not work for you. So start here if you're doing any level of troubleshooting. That's good. And so uh, circling back to those, uh, oh yeah, so we're, we're good. I'm sorry, so uh, circling back to those document types uh, we've outlined, we will use. Uh, here's an example of enabling the document signature flag at the right. document, type uh, document type level. So as you can see here, you know, all the components we've discussed are required um, for the success of the IDM and DocuSign integration. Yeah, and I think just kind of reiterating that point of knowing your process, knowing which one of these document types you want to actually select, because if your organization isn't implementing contract redline document, right. right, then it wouldn't be necessarily appropriate for you to use that and enable that on that document type. Right. Um, and it is just as simple as a flag, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Just go click the flag and then you're good to go for that doc type. Exactly. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time talking about the setup, the prerequisites, and the changes to current state processing. So as changes arise within the organization, it's essential to socialize those changes. Absolutely. Um, so we want to make sure that you have a solid communication plan in place. Mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about this many of times with our clients and found that to be successful as we see sometimes, you know, if you're, you're implementing something, especially if it's a full-on large implementation, and you, your end users are using this application and right. they're not aware, right. they're gonna get frustrated, they're right. not gonna wanna use it, they're not gonna adapt, um, especially if they're familiar with an older application that they've used for decades. Right. So something as small as this IDM and DocuSign, this integration, it is still a game changer mm -hmm. for anybody using the application. Mm -hmm. And so just having maybe a 90, 60, 30 day plan or however makes, whatever makes sense for the size of your organization, communicating that, making it open to questions, feedback, yep. uh, setting up uh, training schedules, training meetings, mm -hmm. and having a solid training plan in place, that's going to help them be a little bit more comfortable with the uncomfortable and the unknown, right? But, right. So that's that's a that's a big one there. Um, and I think with this specifically, like a lot of organizations that we've worked with and that I've worked with as well, this is probably a, a pretty manual process. Right. Um, I'm, I spoke with one client recently that is printing, walking to a desk and signing. So even though that process is manual, understanding that the change is there to enhance their job and what they're doing and to make it easier, we do find that there is sometimes that resistance if that change isn't communicated or as you said, socialized appropriately. Right, I agree. Yeah, so another thing to think about is the actual testing itself, right? So before the implementation, you wanna make sure you're testing until your heart is fully content with the outcome of right. all the testing <laughs> business processes that you had to test. You know, you want to make sure that the functionality is working as designed. Yep. I cannot stress that part enough. Yep. You want to make sure that when you're testing in the right tenants, uh, if you have data refreshes, if mm -hmm. you have monthly CUs rolling out, you want to make sure that those changes are not impacting 
what you've worked hard on that design yeah. and testing functionality. Cause we, we've seen that happen so many times and mm -hmm. it, it's definitely the gotcha for yep. us. Yep. Um, so this will definitely act as an opportunity to identify uh, perhaps if there's additional process gaps, maybe we didn't consider mm -hmm. um, and allow for those corrective actions. Yep. Uh, another thing we want to think about is the go live date. Maybe there's some conflicts with auditing or blackout yeah. dates, and that's a huge thing. I know it's the holidays coming up, so you want to think about um, if there's time off. You know, a lot of people are going to be up off. You know, those are big considerations when thinking about a go live date, even for this implementation. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's get down to brass tacks and the show and tell portion of this. So we're really just going to kind of step you through what an example scenario might look like if you're doing some level of testing or even what it might look like once you're live within the application. So again, remember that we're taking this approach from a contract manager perspective. So we start with creating our contract. In this specific example, we're going to be using IDM to create our contract document template internally. So we're using this feature to say, Mr. Supplier, you're using our documents for this contract. Once all of that contract detail is loaded to into the application, you want to make sure that you use the Select Create Contract Document button. Um, and that way, your template is going to be populated with the information that you just spent time filling into the application and it's going to be indexed in IDM with this contract detail. If you're using contract approvals, the release action is going to be your trigger, just as it would if you weren't using any DocuSign process. Uh, but it's going to kick off that approval. I think another thing to kind of mention that is important to note is that the DocuSign process is not embedded into the automation for contract approval, so it right. sits separately. And as we mentioned earlier, you can use any document type in conjunction with your electronic signature process. It just may look a little bit different. So that's why we kind of emphasize identifying those scenarios mm -hmm. by your resources and making sure that you're really do doing some thorough testing. In the instance where you may be using the supplier's contracts, because we know that that often arises as well, you're working with a supplier that doesn't want your papers, they want their own, you can still incorporate the electronic signature process into that contract life cycle. So if your vendor sends you a document, you can upload it to your contract using the context apps related information function. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you've created your contract document, you can validate it there as well. You'll see in that screenshot a thumbnail mm -hmm. of a document that we populated, or you can validate it after you've uploaded. Um, and then in order to initiate the DocuSign process, once this is complete and you've done your validation, you're going to need to access that in document management. So now what we're looking at here is the document in IDM. And so one of the biggest changes you're going to see with all of those prerequisites that we've discussed is you're going to see a signature button. So that doesn't go there without having the proper security, without having the document types defined. So all of that is going to enable that signature button. By selecting that signature button, you're going to experience a pop-up that's going to allow you to complete some additional fields. So if you are using DocuSign today, you may be familiar with templates within DocuSign. And as long as your integration is working properly, you're going to also have access to those templates that reside in DocuSign. So you can choose from there, or you can choose to not use a template, whichever is most appropriate for your contract. You want to confirm that the edit envelope flag is enabled, like you see here in the screenshot. And then you're going to go ahead and enter the recipient's name, email address, along with your subject and your email messaging. So it, it's actually really straightforward. It's right. not, you know, there's no secrets. There's no like gotchas in this stage. Um, and once this section is complete within uh, IDM, you're going to go ahead and click send. So once the document is sent from IDM, DocuSign will pop open. And from there, you can drop in the signature detail if no template is being used. So you can drag and drop in the signature, the initial timestamp, once you've completed your document in DocuSign, you're going to go ahead and you're going to send it from there. What I'll always recommend our clients do is go back into Infor Document Management and confirm that the process has been initiated with DocuSign. And you can do that by taking a look at the icon there. It's going to have turned from just a gray color to yellow, which is your transmission indicator that it's going. And that signature tab will be available as well with the document envelope detail. 
Your recipient's gonna have received their email letting them know that their doc, they have a document to review and a notification with a message that's gonna create a link for them to access that document. Once they select on the link and open it, they can finish signing off their detail. When they hit finish, it's gonna tell the system that the signature capture is complete and it'll send a confirmation, it being DocuSign, will send a confirmation via email back to the recipient. All, IDM also confirms the document signature has completed as well, and this does take some time. It's transmitting in between applications, so I would recommend refreshing in document management. But your confirmation, there's gonna be a visual one that says the document was digitally signed, and your icon is then gonna turn from yellow to green as your visual indicator. Additionally, on that signature tab, you're gonna have the envelope detail with the download option. From there, you download a zip file that's gonna provide for you uh, the download certificate direct from DocuSign, as well as the contract document that's been signed off. So that information is stored within and for document management. Now, some of our clients, uh, they have that as a manual process where maybe today they're storing that within a SharePoint, but that's not necessary any longer as Invor Document Management is going to have that document indexed into your, to the contract as well as identify what contract version number that is. So to summarize and some things to consider, we talked about how the minimal, there's minimal setup and the level of effort needed to enable the signature process with DocuSign is actually quite low. Um, we talked about and emphasized the importance of understanding what your organizational license in with DocuSign and knowing that it's required. It's not something that comes within for that is separate. Uh, we talked about and we outlined an example business process and we talked about how determining the needs that are best for the organization is gonna help you figure out where to place that document signature capture process. And then we went through the steps of what a test scenario could look like and we discussed detailed testing of that business process scenario along with those key players and stakeholders and including them in your conversations as well as that testing and process review. And then lastly, we also talked about creating or updating process documentation with any changes. So today, a lot of you may be doing this as a manual process outside of any application and storing it in a SharePoint, as we mentioned, but keeping track of what processes you're updating just helps for future training and onboarding of new individuals into your organization and that process. So we wanna thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. For any questions about our presentation or just about RPI in general, please contact our RPI offices, um, and you can do that here at questions at rpic.com.